As the years roll by, there are new people and events to learn about. And so it often happens that events and people of the past are clouded over or completely forgotten. So it's probable that you have never heard the American Board of Commissions for Foreign Missions that was founded in 1810. This was the board that would later send out Adoniram Judson to India in 1812. And if you don't know the name of the board, it is even less likely that you know the names of Samuel Mills, James Richards, Francis Rabbins, Harvey Loomis, Brian Green, or of a prayer meeting that they attended that's known as the Haystack Prayer Meeting. So let's take a look at these men and how God used them to reach the world with the gospel. Welcome to the God's Peculiar People podcast, where we learn about the lives and characteristics of God's people. Much of this video will be taken from a book called The Haystack Prayer Meeting, an account of its origin and spirit. The names of Elliot and Mayhew, Brainerd and Sargent, Kirkland and Wheelock were familiar in New England homes and represented the militant spirit of missions when the parents of the Haystack men were children. During the latter part of the 18th century and the early part of the 19th century, several missionary societies were formed in the United States. As early as 1796, the Baptist organized a mission society for carrying on work in the state of New York. The Connecticut Missionary Society was instituted in 1798 and the Massachusetts Missionary Society in 1799. In 1802, the Massachusetts Baptist Missionary Society was organized. And in 1804, the Massachusetts Missionary Society amended its constitution so as to embrace work in foreign parts through the more distant regions of the earth as circumstances shall invite and the ability of the society shall admit. In looking back over the pioneer days and organized missionary effort, it is instructive to observe that the unity of missions was ever borne in mind. It was largely a question of administration and not a new kind of missionary spirit that drew the sharp distinction between home and foreign missions, which in those early days was not so apparent as it is today. There had existed in Newport a foreign missionary society as early as 1773, but this society was short-lived owing to the outbreak of the American Revolution. During 1806 and 1807, the American churches had given some $6,000 to Dr. Carey's work in India. The Massachusetts Baptist Missionary Society, though doing a work almost solely in the new settlements within these United States, expressly stated in its constitution that it would not limit its work to America, but would extend it further if circumstances should render it proper. It was the Catholic spirit of missions which characterized the later part of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century in the religious life of America. Samuel Mills himself, though properly associated almost exclusively with foreign missions, was among the foremost pioneer missionaries on the western frontiers of the American Commonwealth. The meeting at the Haystack 100 years ago had therefore the noblest spiritual antecedents. It was the crystallization of the holy hopes and longings of devout men and women who had lived and labored before it. To no group of men might our Lord's words be more aptly applied than to those of the Haystack meeting. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. So how did this Haystack prayer meeting come about? Prayer meetings by groups of students were being maintained zealously at this time. And when Samuel J. Mills entered college in the spring of 1806, he found Williams College under the influence of a great revival. On Wednesdays, the men previously mentioned met south of West College beneath the willow trees. And on Saturdays, the meetings were held north of the college buildings beneath the maple trees in a meadow. On the day of this prayer meeting, it was a sultry afternoon in August 1806, the five men met for prayer beneath the trees in Sloan's Meadow. The atmosphere was laden with moisture, and the threatening clouds had doubtless detained many who on a fair day would have been present. The five men who attended were Samuel J. Mills, William Richards, Francis L. Robbins, Harvey Loomis, and Brian Green. The meeting was interrupted by the approaching storm. It began to rain. The thunder rolled with deafening sound, familiar to those who dwell among the hills. The sharp, quick flashes of lightning seemed like snapping whips driving the men to shelter. They crouched beside a large haystack, which stood on the spot now marked by the missionary monument. Here, Partially protected at least from the storm, they conversed on large themes. The topic that engaged their interest was Asia. The work of the East India Company, with which they were all somewhat acquainted, naturally turned their thoughts to the people with which this company sought trade. Mills especially waxed eloquent on the moral and religious needs of this, these people, 
and a fire with a great enthusiasm, he proposed that the gospel of light be sent to those dwelling in some benighted lands. All but Loomis responded to this inspiration of Mills. Loomis contended that the East must first be civilized before the work of the missionary could begin. The others contended that God would cooperate with all who did their part, for he would that all men should be partakers of the salvation of Christ. Finally, at Mill's word, Come, let us make it a subject prayer under the haystack. While the dark clouds are going and the clear sky is coming, they all knelt in prayer. Loomis only withheld his voice. When Mills prayed, he remembered certain objections raised by Loomis in their heated discussion, and with all the intensity of his being prayed, O oh God, strike down the arm with the red artillery of heaven that should be raised against a herald of the cross. Their prayers were ended, they rose to sing a hymn, and then, while the skies were clearing, went from the haystack to their rooms. Now, it's alleged in other accounts that while they gathered, they conversed specifically about William Carey's work and inquiry into the obligation of Christians to use means for the conversion of the heathen. Whether this was the work that helped to push their interest of foreign missions forward or not is unclear according to other sources that I've read, but it is believed by some that this was the work that they were discussing on that afternoon in August 1806. Now, who were these five men of the Haystack meeting? One of the most suggestive facts concerning the men who met beside the Haystack 100 years ago at the time of this book's writing was that only one of them, James Richards, actually labored for an extended period in a foreign land. Even Mills himself saw only two months' service in Africa, the field which, above all others, most deeply appealed to him. It is in this fact that the message of the Haystack men is unique. Their lives interpreted foreign missions not simply as an extensive activity, but also as an intensive one. These men reached out to lives in which Christ was foreign, and not simply to lives dwelling in foreign lands. Mill's most notable missionary work was in the Ohio and Mississippi Valleys, where he accomplished two missionary tours, circulating the scriptures and religious tracts in regions where great destitution prevailed. The first of the tours was in company with the Reverend J. F. Schirmerhorn and extended into the southwestern part of the United States. The second, with the Reverend Daniel Smith, through approximately the same region, led to New Orleans, where he ministered to English prisoners and American soldiers. He was largely instrumental in organizing the American Bible Society. His return from the West and South was followed by short periods of residence in many of the large eastern cities. This gave him an opportunity to do work among the poor and destitute in the congested centers of population. His journey to Africa under the auspices of the American Colonization Society in 1818 was in a way the long-dreamed-of mission of his life. He, with Reverend Ebenezer Burgess, engaged in a work of exploration to select a suitable place for a home for African Americans. He died on the return voyage in 1818 in the 35th year of his life. Loomis, after completing his theological studies under Mill's father and Dr. Porter, engaged in an aggressive frontier work in Bangor, Maine, where his labors resulted in establishing the first congregational church. In his preaching and intercourse with his people, writes Williams' biographer Calvin Durfee, he always showed himself to be a Christian gentleman, but was an uncompromising Puritan in his principles. True to his early convictions, as soon as Mr. Loomis was qualified to enter on the work of the ministry, he directed his steps to the most difficult and self-denying field of home missionary labor, where he remained most usefully and acceptably employed till the summons came. Robbins, like Loomis, engaged in a frontier ministry work in New Hampshire until 1816, when he was ordained pastor over the church in Enfield, Connecticut. For 34 years, he labored in this parish and died in 1850. Green spent his early days in Williamstown, his father having moved his family there for the education opportunities offered by the college. Shortly after his graduation, Green studied theology but preached only for a brief time. He settled in Sotus, New York, became prominent in the state legislature, and in 1843 was elected member of Congress. His public career was of exceptional purity, and his life among his townsmen was one that deeply endeared him as a just and Christian man. Green is also credited with creating the monument aforementioned to honor the Haystack meeting and subsequent missions movement. Richard had always manifested an earnest desire to devote his life to the Christian ministry. After his graduation at Williams and his theological preparation at Andover, he went to Philadelphia to acquaint himself somewhat with medical practice. He and Mills were ordained on the same day at Newburyport in June 1815. Then, when he departed for Ceylon in October of the same year, he is reported to have said, 
I have been waiting with anxiety almost eight years for an opportunity to go and preach Christ among the heathen. I have often wept at the long delay, but the day on which I now bid farewell to my native land is the happiest day of my life. For six or seven years he labored in India, suffering much from poor health. His manner of preaching, writes Calvin Durfee, was plain, didactic, and pointed, showing an earnest and devoted spirit rather than remarkable talents. Still, it should be remembered that he obtained a degree of respectability in two professions, theological and medical. But it was in imparting counsel and encouragement to his associates that he most excelled, and for which he was sincerely loved while living and deeply lamented when dead. The immediate effect of the Haystack meeting was a deepened interest in missions on the part of the men themselves and upon others who attended the meetings. So long as the weather permitted, the students met in the Maple Grove. When the cold weather came, the meetings were held in the kitchen of a Mrs. Bardwell. Two years after the Haystack meeting, the first missionary society to be organized in America began its career in the lower northwest room of Old East College. That is, it was the first foreign missionary society which aimed to effect in the persons of its members a mission to the heathen. This society was simply called Brethren at the suggestion of Mills, its founder. The Constitution, the records, writes Mr. T.C. Richards in his recent Life of Mills, and the signatures were all written in cipher and the whole matter kept a profound secret. The reason for secrecy, as stated by Ezra Fisk 20 years afterwards, were the possibility of failure, public opinions, which could see in foreign missions projects only overheated zeal and fanaticism, and the modesty required of them, lest they be thought rashly imprudent. There existed no American Foreign Missionary Society at the time. These men were contemplating a foreign mission. Several of the group entered into correspondence with a Dr. Bogue of Gosport, England, willingly offering themselves as missionaries if the London Missionary Society needed them. Mills resented this appeal to a foreign society, feeling that it was the duty of the American churches to send them. At the suggestion of the professors at the seminary, and also of Drs. Worcester and Spring, the men made a statement of their case to present to the General Association of Massachusetts. The statement was presented and resulted in favor of instituting a board of commissioners for foreign missions, for the purpose of devising ways and means, and adopting and prosecuting measures for promoting the spread of the gospel in heathen lands. Thus was instituted the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions at Bradford in the year of our Lord, 1810. Nearly two years afterwards, the first five missionaries of the board, Adonai Judson, Samuel Knott, Samuel Newell, Gordon Hall, and Luther Rice, were ordained at Salem and shortly after sailed for Calcutta. We shall never know completely how many lives and how many movements owe their inspiration and impulse to the great revival of 1806 and of the Haystack prayer meeting. But we do know that through it and its individual members, a mighty influence for the kingdom of God has been carried forward. We know that the first distinctly foreign missionary efforts of the Presbyterian and Dutch Reformed churches in America were through a society, the United Foreign Missionary Society, inspired by Mills. The American Baptist Missionary Union is also vitally associated in that awakening a century ago for Adonai and Judson Jr. was its first and for many years its only foreign missionary. The American Bible Society also is conspicuously a child of Mills' inspiration, and the long list of Williams and Williamstown disciples is only a partial list of the vast throng of inspired lives which have shared with the Haystack men the gospel of deeds. And it is believed by many historians that all missions organizations in the United States can trace their history back to the Haystack prayer meeting.